Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Philip. Can you hear me? I can indeed, and uh, I presume you can hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you for joining. Pleasure. So this meeting is being recorded. We'll try to record it for everyone who cannot uh, join, and we'll start in five minutes. I actually made the Mr. Philip a co-host, so you can share your slide if you wish to. Yes, I think we can see the slides perfectly. So we'll just wait for three minutes and we can start. Uh, guys, please note that at the end of the meeting, we'll have a link on like how did you see the meeting and the evaluation of the meeting. So I'll just put it in the chat so you can join and fill it, please. Can everyone see the slides clearly? Can you write in the chat? Guys, can you hear me? Hello? I think people are saying yes on the chat. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all for joining.
So welcome everyone to the College of Graduate Studies. Today we have Mr. Philip from the Provost Office. He's a ranking project manager and he will have a presentation on the research impact and the university rankings, as you can see on the screen. Uh, hope you have uh, fun and enjoy and learn a lot of new things today. So Mr. Philip, I think you can start if you wish to. All the best. Okay, thank you very much. And welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I will try to make it fun, but um, please also write any uh, questions you have in the chat box and um, we can discuss any points that you have as well as what I'm going to, what I've prepared for you. So my idea today was to talk to you for about half an hour um, using some slides. Um, this, by the way, is the exact same presentation that I've given to all the faculty members at the different colleges. And when I gave that, somebody uh, said to me, you, you need to give this also to the College of Graduate Studies as well. So, um, yeah, I, I, without any further ado, I'll get cracking. We want to talk about university rankings and how you get involved in that at an individual level um, and how you create research impact. And that impact aggregates up to the impact of the entire university. So um, I'll just start off by saying what we'll do. We'll do um, we'll go through university rankings and how they're calculated. They call the ranking systems call how their calculations um, work as their methodologies. Uh, then we can look at some basic uh, bibliometric indicators. And I'd just like to mention the major databases that we use um, when we're calculating these indicators. Then I can give you some tips on identifying your research in that literature and some tips on how you can promote it. Okay, and then we'll have a long Q&A session um, depending on your questions. So this is me. Um, I actually was a, a researcher at one point earlier on in my career and I then went into industry and I, I worked in STM publishing um, for a long time in a company called Thomson Reuters. Um, it used to be called ISI, and it is the owner and founder of one of the major uh, citation databases that we'll be discussing today. Um, I've also been a consultant in the Middle East, and I've worked with lots of universities. I've been a publisher. Um, I've helped universities with their rankings. Uh, I've done a training, uh, a series of training courses, and I'm now at the UAE University leading all the projects related to university rankings. Now, um, where do we stand in those rankings? Well, as you will have all seen uh, recently announced, um, we rank in the top 300 universities in the world, according to QX. We rank number 284. Now, um, a recent estimate by the United Nations says that in the whole world, there are approximately 28,000 universities, depending on exactly how you define a university. So if there are 28,000 and we rank 284, I think that means we're just about in the top 1% in the world. So that's a huge achievement and it's something to be very proud of. And I'm certainly very proud to be at UAEU. We're fifth in the Arab region and 27th university uh, in the world who is under 50 years old. That's quite a good statistic as well. Now, the other major ranking system is Times Higher Education. And in Times, they rank slightly differently. Their methodology is different and therefore their results are different. And we rank just outside the top 300. So it's not such a different result. Um, but we rank in the group that's 301 to 350. We're 38th in Asia, 31st in the emerging economies, and we are 50th under 50 in their ranking. Now, I've just mentioned two rankings, but there are of course many more. The Times Higher Education World University Rankings methodology is, it breaks down like this. There are five major groups of indicators teaching, research, citations, 
international outlook and industry income. And each one of those can then be broken down further into uh, other uh, indicators. You will notice, by the way, that in teaching, which accounts for 30% of their ranking, a reputation survey counts for 15% of the whole ranking, right? There's a survey that goes out to tens of thousands of academics all over the world, and they ask people, in your field of research and in your area of the world, which universities provide the best teaching experience? And, um, and, and the, the people reply, they say, these are the universities I think provide a good teaching experience. And they times then crunches those numbers and reports and gives us a, a value for how we scored in that survey. Then they do exactly the same over here in the research section for how is our reputation on research. So together, 15% plus 18% makes 33%. So a third of Times ranking is based on the reputation of the university. Um, the rest of it is based on things like publications, research income, research productivity, the number of citations that your papers receive. And then there's international outlook, for example, um, proportion of papers with whom there is an international co-author. That counts as well towards our internationalness. Now, over on the other side of the page, QS, their ranking is done rather differently. They also have a big reputation section, um, but, and their citations per faculty is much reduced. It only counts for 20% of their ranking. I've listed another one here, Shanghai. The Shanghai methodology looks a lot at, did students go on to win Nobel Prizes? So graduate students from the university, did they go on and become leaders in their field. Um, so these are the, some examples of different methodologies. Now I've mentioned uh, papers or articles or research uh, um, output. What I'm talking about is articles published in journals. And I want to show you um, a simple basic um, indicator or bibliometric uh, metric, which is called publication, simply the productivity of an entity. It could be a university, it could be an individual person, it could be a journal. In this case, I'm showing you countries. So if we look at how many papers were published, research papers in research journals, by the UAE in 2013, you can see it was around 3,000. Uh, that's um, not very, uh, if you look at Egypt and Saudi Arabia, they of course produced many more publications. And of, and of course, the reason is that uh, they have a larger populations, they've got more people, they've got more scientists, and they produce more papers. That's obvious, and it's okay. Now, if we look at the next slide, I'm going to show you a different indicator. And that is citations. That means how many times did other scientists refer to those papers that were published on slide one. And now you see a bigger uh, um, disparity, but again, UAE is the lowest. And the reason for that, again, is it is the smallest out of those three countries. So looking at the overall citation count isn't really fair because some countries are bigger than others. And if we looked at citations at university level, it's still not fair because some universities are bigger than others. So what we do is we divide the number of citations by papers. And what you've got then is citations per paper. And now you can see that three countries with different sizes are comparable. You can see, for example, the UAE is now higher than Egypt. And uh, that's because even though Egypt produces more articles and, more, and receives more citations, once you, do, you normalize for the size of that output, it's the UAE that does better. Now, I have a question for you. Um, Abdel Rahman, could you just look at the chat? I want to ask the uh, participants if they can notice the downward trend on this graph. 
And if anybody can offer any um, suggestion of why it's coming down. Uh, yes, guys, you can write in the chat, please. Guys, any suggestions? Or shout out if you have an idea. Make sure you unmute yourself. I did unmute myself. Uh, there is Rufaida saying higher standards for accepting papers. Oh, here we have an answer. Because more and more papers are published, more options. That's one answer, yes. Another answer, any other answers? Okay, I'm going to offer language. An okay, I'm going to I'm going to offer an answer. The 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 very uh, simple point is there has been less time to cite papers published three years ago than there has for papers published seven years ago, and as we tend towards the present day, if you look at 2020, the numbers of citations will be almost zero because there hasn't been time yet to. Uh, to, to cite them and to wait for the citing articles to be published. It takes time. So whenever you look at any um, citation statistics, make sure that it is time normalized. So if you're comparing somebody, somebody says, oh, I have received, um, for example, okay, somebody who is maybe your professor, might be a lot older than you, may have a very high H index. And the H index is based upon citations they've received to papers that maybe they published 10, 20 years ago. Now, if you're an, an early career researcher, you haven't had the time yet for your papers to accumulate as many citations. So normalizing by time is necessary, uh, especially when comparing people at the early stage of their career with more uh, established researchers. Another, another indicator I want to mention today is the journal impact factor. I'm sure you've all heard of this. <clears throat> it's perhaps the most famous bibliometric, uh, but it isn't always a good predictor of the article, uh, of how many times the article itself is going to be cited. The journal impact factor is a really good indicator of the impact of the journal, but not necessarily of the articles in the journal. I took this uh, uh, paper some years back and I noticed that it was published in the journal The Lancet. Now in The Lancet, in the year this paper was published, um, we could see that if you list the journals by impact factor, it ranks number four <clears throat> with an impact factor of 45.217. Now, there are about 12,000 journals with an impact factor. So if you rank number four out of 12,000, that's pretty good. So the authors on this paper are going to say to their friends and people evaluating them, I got a paper accepted and published in The Lancet, and that has an impact factor of 45. But if we look at how many times the article was cited, it wasn't cited at all, zero times. So what's, which is right? Should we be looking at the zero or should we be looking at the 45? Remember, the 45 refers to the journal and the zero refers to the article. So I would be willing to bet that most people who were associated with the paper would be more likely to talk about its impact, the impact factor of the journal. The converse situation shows another article published in the International Journal of Electrochemical Science. Now, looking further down that list of impact factors from number four, which was the Lancet, down to number 5,041, we find the International Journal of Electrochemical Science, and the impact factor is 1.5. But these authors are not going to be interested in that because they will notice that their article has been cited 27 times. So they'll say, no, don't worry about the impact factor. Look at my article. That's what we want to talk about. My article has influenced 27 
subsequently published papers. <clears throat> so what people tend to do is to look at the citations to their own articles. And when people evaluate you, they will want to know how many papers have you published and how many times were they cited. And what they do sometimes is take an average citations per paper like we did with the countries before. So imagine that you have published 10 papers and I put them here over on the second column is the number of citations those papers have received. <clears throat> and I've ranked the papers from top to bottom in order of the number of citations they've received. So paper number one has been cited six times. Papers two and three have been cited four times and so on. And the last three papers have not been cited at all. So the total number of citations is 20 and the total paper count is 10. So 20 divided by 10 means you've got an average of two citations per paper. Now what happens if you publish one highly cited paper in addition to those 10? That means you have an, an 11th paper which has been cited 200 times. Now because they're ranked in order of citations, this one rises to the top and becomes paper number one. And what used to be paper number one with six citations now becomes paper two and so on. Now that is something that actually does happen. Uh, somebody has raised their hand. Sudha, can you, can you speak? Unmute and speak. Uh, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, this is my first year. I'm doing my first year master's program in clinical psychology. And uh, I don't have much idea because of the, I mean, whatever the topic you're talking, but I'm interested in uh, research field. That's the reason I joined the session. So I just got some basic uh, doubt. I don't know if it is appropriate to ask you, but I just want to clear it with you. Um, while doing our program, uh, we need to uh, search for the contemporary journal articles, you know, and uh, when we, uh, uh, you will have some rare diagnosis like global developmental delay where you know it is not uh, it don't have that awareness uh, in the society so uh, we don't find uh, you know um, the contemporary gen journals for the same diagnosis so in that case how we can select because uh, general impact is really important when you address something right when you're addressing some issue. So how can we match uh, the information that you're telling when you don't have uh, such vast uh, available information uh, in, I mean, in uh, social app or in Google? How yeah, okay, thanks. Um, in fact, we, you do have access to uh, some other databases and I'm going to show you two databases in a minute, um, both of which you can access via the university webpage. And what I'm showing you at the moment is as a kind of example that could be used based on any set of papers in any database. So um, yeah, depending on your subject, you would use one database more than another. Um, but a lot of people will talk to you about this specific point. And so if I'm just, what I'll do is I'll go through this as a generic example, and then we'll talk about the precise databases that you're going to use and the people will use who are evaluating you. So thanks for raising that, Sudha, and, and um, we'll, we'll discuss it more in a minute. Thank you, sir. So here, what people will do sometimes is they'll say that this indicator, citations per paper, is not good because it can be so easily influenced by one very highly cited paper. And one field where this is prevalent is physics. There are some physics papers, and I'm not exaggerating, that they have 2,000 authors on them. 2,000 authors on the same paper. And generally, when people count in a database the publications, every single one of those authors will be credited with that paper. 
equally. And any citations that it receives will also be accredited to every single one of the authors. Again, so you can pick up two or 3,000 citations if you get your name on one physics paper, uh, one of these big physics papers. And this is a physicist here. His name is Jorge Hirsch. And uh, he noted this point and said that using averages is not the best way to evaluate an individual's scientific research output. What he said is that with any set of articles, be it from an individual or a journal or a university, you're going to find a few, a small number of papers that are very highly cited. And most of the papers, a large number of papers, will have either zero or very low citations. And then you have this curve that looks like that, if you look at those dots. What Jorge Hirsch said is, why don't we find the point where the number of citations is equal to the number of papers? And we will call that point H. So it's possible, we don't know if he named it after himself. It was originally called the Hirsch Index, but it then became to be known as the H Index. And that's how it's calculated. We say, well, how many, what's the number where the number of articles and the number of citations is equal? So if I go back to our example now, what we do is with this set of 10 papers, organized by citation count, we go to paper one and we ask ourselves a question, has paper number one been cited one time or more? Well, yes, because it's been cited six times. So then we move down one step and we say, has paper number two been cited two times or more? Yes, it has. So has paper number three been cited three times or more? Yes, it has. Has paper number four been cited four times or more? No, it hasn't. You can see that that doesn't work for paper four and, and none of the papers below will generate the answer yes. Number five has not been cited five times. So we draw a line under paper three and we say this set of articles has an H index of three because three of the papers were cited at least three times. Now, when you publish that highly cited paper, you ask yourself again, has paper number one been cited once or more? Yes. Has paper two been cited twice or more? Yes. Paper three has been cited at least three times and paper four has been cited at least four times. But paper five has not been cited five times. So now the H index goes to four. So what Hirsch said is that this is a better way of, in, of evaluating people's scientific contribution because with one highly cited paper, the H index goes from three to four, which is not uh, a big increase. Now, I, I've actually met Jorge Hirsch, who invented the H index, and I asked him, um, I wanted to know his H index before I met him. So I looked in three different databases. This one here is Google Scholar, and it showed me the H index was 62. The next one is Scopus, and that showed me the H index was 52. And the bottom one is Web of Science, and that showed me the H index was 56. So those are three different databases, which gave me three different answers. And that's because each of the databases is made of different articles, and therefore of different citations. So if anybody asks you about your H index, you should ask them, in which database would you like me to calculate it? You know how to calculate it now, and you would need to refer to one of these three databases. Now, mostly scientists use either Web of Science or Scopus. And I'll just introduce those to you in a minute. But first, I want to do you a test. Could you please now look at two researchers, researcher A, and researcher B, and tell me what is the H index for researcher A, and what is the H index for researcher B? You can use the chat.
or you can shout out. Yes, guys, you can write in the chat or you can use your mics. But please raise your hands before using the mics to avoid a lot of people talking at the same time. Okay, we, we're having some answers here, yeah. We've got, someone says six for A, and someone says six for B. Someone says five for A. Could you have another look at it, please? And um, yeah, we're having, most people are saying six for A and six to B, which is the right answer. We've got a couple of uh, other answers which we'll sort out now. So the point is that if you look down researcher A, you get as far as number six, which has been cited six times or more. And seven has not been cited seven times. So we draw the line there and the H index is six. And if that person, wants to improve their H index, they need to work on their impact. They need to promote their papers and tell the world what they've done. And um, if, imagine if paper number seven gets one more citation, then the H index will become seven. On the other hand, researcher B has only published six papers and all of them have received six citations or more. So we draw the line there and the H index is six, not 88, six, because six papers have been cited six times or more. And this person's H index will never increase until they publish more papers. Okay, so I, I mentioned before one of the, um, uh, the, the databases. This is the guy here who invented um, uh, citation indexing. His name is Eugene Garfield and he published a paper in 1955 saying we need to make an index for citations. What he said was at the end of the article the references contain more valuable information than the content of the article itself because it tells you what the article is built upon. So if somebody didn't have access to this content, they could look at the references and they would know everything they needed to know in order to be able to write this article. And if you look on the left, there's a nice image here of, um, and it shows a quote by Sir Isaac Newton. And he said, if I have seen a little further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So he, he came out with some physical theories in the 1700s and he was widely lauded as being a, a genius. And what he said was, it, it's not really, I'm not doing this in a vacuum. I needed all of those people, all of those others to do all that work first so that I could put the icing on the cake. So he was in effectively, he was citing his peers. That's the early form of referencing. Um, by the way, where have you seen this quote, on the shoulders of giants? Anyone? Has anybody used Google Scholar? If you switch on Google Scholar, you'll see on the shoulders of giants written on their homepage. And so the idea is that when you've published a paper, you have cited references going backwards to papers that were published before your paper. But your paper then may be included on the citation list of future papers. So citations go backwards and cited, and you can see in both directions because we now have access to the internet. So we can navigate between articles that cited each other. Now I've mentioned Web of Science a couple of times. This was the original database used for evaluating publications and citations and um, it was founded by Eugene Garfield in 1964 and it's got about 70 million articles in it. 
Now, you have access to the Web of Science via the UAEU uh, web page. I could demonstrate it, but maybe it's easier if I just tell you um, because I've got the PowerPoint on. But if you go to UAEU, just the normal home page, and you go to the right hand side and scroll over where it says libraries and you click on main library. Then you roll over again and further to the left there's a section that says databases. If you click on databases and you search, do you click W, you will find the web of science and you all have access to it. And you can search 70 million articles going back to 1900 and all the citations going between them. Oh yeah, um, somebody asked, how is the journal impact factor calculated? Um, I didn't include that, I just wanted to mention it's the only the journals in these two, so science and social sciences, within the web of science, only those journals will receive a journal impact factor. Um, if, you're in the, if your journal is in the Arts and Humanities Citation Index, sorry, there's no impact factor for those journals. And any journal not in the web of science does not get a journal impact factor. The other major database <coughs> to use, to which you also have access, is called Scopus. Now this one's easier to find on the UAEU webpage. If you go to, uh, on the right, you scroll over, I think you have to click main library, then as soon as you scroll, um, scroll over again, you can actually see the word Cybal, uh, sorry, Scopus. You can see Scopus and just click it and then you will go into this database. Now it's a, it's a relatively newer database, founded in 2004, but also contains about 70 million articles. Um, they go back further, uh, but their citations are more recent. So uh, it has some advantages and some disadvantages. Google Scholar was also launched in 2005 and its, um, its uh, unique selling point is that it's free, which is really useful uh, for people who don't have access to databases, but we don't really know anything about it. We don't know how many articles are in, how many journals are listed, um, <clears throat> because it's done by um, searching and crawling the web we're not quite sure, whereas the other two are databases of journals. So uh, when you're evaluating people, Google Scholar is not as good. Okay, now I said we would do a little, a few minutes on how to identify your research in those databases. Now, one thing is um, your name is not the best way to search for your own articles. I've tried on my own name and I realized that there are loads of different ways of spelling my name. Um, I'm now thinking of people in, in the Middle East. You also have some names which are very uh, common and can be spelt in different names. I think of the example Mohammed, which could be spelt with one M or two M's, or it could be spelt with Mohammed or Mohammed. And there are other variations as well. So um, what other way could we use to identify ourselves? Uh, I'll just provoke your memory here. What was the first thing I told you about myself? Can anyone remember? How, how should we identify ourselves in the literature? Yes, okay. Prize goes to Ali Al Rahma, who said Orchid. The Orchid ID, Amaria, too late, you got there second. If you remember, my, on the first slide, I said um, the, that was my Orchid. So I use that to identify all my articles, and you'll have, you will do the same. It's, um, it's really good. If you then search in Web of Science by your Orchid, uh, you, you don't have this problem. Look, there's one by Phil Burnell. That's actually not me. It's about something else. And then we have one that is also not me, uh, even though it says Philip Burnell. So there are 115 articles in the Web of Science that respond to P. Purnell. 
similarly, looking in Scopus, this time I searched PJ Purnell, and I found five articles. The first one's not me, um, and there are it's a, and there are some missing here. So the best way to do it is to get yourself an orchid. Um, here's a is a famous uh, quote from America. There was um, somebody who a conversation between two scientists, and one said, "I'm the 38th author." The second one interrupted and said, "Oh dear, that's a pity." And the first one said, "No, no, I haven't finished. I'm the 38th author called Wang on my paper." I looked this up, thinking that can't be true, but it is true. I found the paper. And I found there are 38 authors on that paper, all with the surname Wang. So get yourselves an orchid. Every researcher needs one. It will take you less than one minute. And I challenge you, you are young and you know how to use these, these things. You go to orchid.org. You could do this while listening to this lecture, actually. And I'd be interested to know how many people managed to register for an orchid whilst on this call. Um, you just need to put in some minimal data, open your email account and click I confirm and you'll have an orchid. Don't get two orchids, it's really confusing. Um, I'll skip that part. And the other thing is, while you're doing it, it will invite you to also have a Publons account. This is useful to have as well because you can review Sometimes a journal will ask you to review um, another article. So if you do that, usually there's no way that anybody would ever know you've reviewed it. But if you have a Publons account, it will tell people that yes, you are a reviewer and that, look, I have 12 reviewer merits and people then in your field will learn to recognize you and say, I could contact this person. Now, some ideas about how to promote your research and get citations, because it used to be the way that once you send your article to a journal, the journal says accepted, people sit back and say, okay, now let's see if somebody cites it. But that's no longer good enough. There are so many researchers around the world, you're gonna to have to fight for those citations and compete. So one correlation is um, shown here. If you look at international collaboration, this is for UAE university articles, you will notice that the citation impact is much, much higher. They receive many, many more citations if they are international. By that I mean, if you have a co-author on the article from another country, not the UAE. If you put all those papers together, you can see there's a massive uh, difference in the impact. Uh, another difference is if you manage to collaborate with a corporate author, somebody who works for the private sector, a company, there the difference is even bigger. A massive difference in the impact of papers published with a corporate author and those without. Other things are the number of references. Apparently, the more cited references you put on your paper, so the more people you cite, the more people will cite you. Um, longer articles receive more citations. And also the number of co-authors um, will increase the number of citations. Because if you publish alone, only people who know you or come across your article will cite it. But if you've got three other co-authors, People who know them will also cite it, and you also qualify for the citation. Um, now, a last point, and then I'll finish, um, is uh, how else can you promote your research? Well, there's one system called growqdos.com. It's free of charge. Once you have an orchid, you don't have to spend time typing your articles in. You just put in your orchid, and your articles come up in QDOS. And what QDOS allows you to do is write a short paragraph, three short paragraphs for each article explaining what it's about, why it's important, and what's the global perspective. And you, you write these as if you were talking to your mates, not as if you were talking to a scientist. And then you can link them to your LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter accounts. 
and just push them out every now and then. And that will provoke people to say, oh, that's interesting. They click the link, they go to your article, maybe they might, might even cite it. So I think with that, it's time for me to finish. Wish you best of luck and ask you for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Philip, for the presentation. If you guys have any questions, you can raise your hands or write in the chat. And please do not forget to fill the feedback. Thank you so much, Mr. Philip. Hmm. Guys, please, if you have any questions, you can write it in the chat. I've just seen one really, really tough one, which is about which email address should you use when you're registering for Orchid? Because um, I think you as graduate students, you don't, your university email address doesn't contain your name. And then possibly when you become faculty, it becomes your name. Yeah, that's an awkward one, actually. Um, hmm. I have uh, used, sometimes I, I used um, my personal email address to begin with, and that's fine. Um, and then you can change it later on. If you move to a different institution and you leave the one you're at, you would then no longer have access to that account. So you can change your email address. Um, the idea of the ORCID account is that it's the ORCID number that is the consistent and persistent identifier, not your email address. So you can keep changing your email address, but it's the ORCID ID that should stay the same. Uh, I think someone is asking if you can send her your presentation, but uh, Miss Wadiha, I think we recorded the session, so you can view the recorded session if you have any I think you want to note down. You're welcome to have the slides as well. Uh, Abdel Rahman, if you can send out the slides, uh, anybody who wants them can have them. Yes, oh, true. Asked, Pager has asked, some articles need to be purchased while others are free and readily available online. Is that taken into consideration when someone's research output is evaluated? Good question. No, it's not. Um, you're right. Some some journals require universities to subscribe. And then once they subscribe, everybody at that university can read everything without paying for it because the university has paid a subscription. Um, the new, uh, a new uh, business model of journals is open access. That means that the university has to pay nothing and anybody with access to the internet can access all the articles for free. However, the author has to pay. Someone's got to pay the publisher, and if it's not the reader, then it has to be the author. So some authors are paying $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 uh, for the privilege of publishing their article. And those are called open access articles. Uh, but yeah, you're, to answer your question, that's not taken into account when someone asks what you've published or what, how many citations you've received. And the steps by mail, yes. If you like, I can do a quick demonstration of how to search on um, um, Scopus or Web of Science. Oh, sir, sorry to interrupt, but um, we couldn't uh, uh, search all the articles in the database. I don't know why. Um, okay, this, yeah, I'll come back to that one. Sure, thank you. Amaria, oh, hello, Amaria. Nice to see you. Um, should we go for open access publication? Hmm, that's a good one. Well, if you publish open access, then um, it means that everybody, you, you may have more people viewing your article more quickly uh, because people don't have to have institutional access to a subscription. Um, on the other hand, there is no clear evidence 
that those articles uh, receive more citations yet. Uh, we thought that's what would happen, but it, it hasn't because so many institutions do have subscriptions to major um, publishers. So you also have to think if you do want to publish open access, you need to plan in your research budget where you're going to get the money from to pay as an author to, to make your, art, your article open access. So that also needs to be factored in. So uh, yeah, discuss it with your supervisor, but there's no, there's not a massive advantage to being in an open access publication. It's still a, a small minority of articles that are open access. Uh, oh yeah, somebody's asking Mohammed Mali. Ah, hello, Mohammed. Um, can you elaborate? What is a corporate author? A corporate author is somebody who uh, works in the private sector and who uses that address in, as their affiliation. So when you submit a manuscript to a, um, a journal, uh, you may put UAE University, if, you, if that's your affiliation, but imagine you work for ADNOC. Uh, if you're working with somebody from ADNOC, then they would put ADNOC as their affiliation. So that is the definition of a corporate author. I'm looking through the questions to see if there's anything else. Ah, right. Rina de Jesus asks, um, should I pay attention to how many times my article was cited rather than journal impact factor? I think you need to pay attention to both things because you will generate your citation impact over your career by citations to your articles. And over time, people more and more are looking at the citations to your article. And in the future, I think that's what they will only look at. But at the moment, people are still asking you to uh, aim to publish in high impact journals. What they mean is um, journals with a high impact factor. So at the moment, you do need to keep that in mind as well. Can we normally share our work on ResearchGate or does it have some legal issues and responsibility? Iman Youssef, very good question. <clears throat> yeah, people like to share their work on sites like ResearchGate and you can share links to your full text article on ResearchGate. And you can share the metadata. So you can share the title, the abstract, and the keywords. But if the journal, if, unless it's an open access article, you don't have the right to upload the full text onto that uh, website, um, the published full text. Because um, when you submitted the manuscript to the journal, at some point you sign copyright over to the journal. So once it's published, it doesn't belong to you anymore. And uh, so you cannot um, upload published full text. What people sometimes do is they say, email me for a copy of the preprint version. So your final version before the one you sent to the journal is still yours and you can send that uh, to people. Okay, someone else is asking um, for a session on how to select journals. Good question, Mohammed. Um, Abdul Rahman, would you like me to do a, a search now on Scopus or Web of Science, or would you like to uh, see if there are any further questions? Uh, guys, do you have any more questions, or should we proceed to the... I think uh, we don't have any more questions. Mr. Philip, right. again. Yeah. Let me just uh, open. Guys, please note that the recorded session will be on our YouTube channel. We will share it with you on email. So we'll just upload it as soon as possible so you can rewatch it if you would like. Or for those who missed the session. I'm just going to unshare and then reshare 
so that you'll be looking at the website. Right, you should now be able to see the university website, can you? Yes, Mr. Philip, it's uh, very clear. Very good. So I always go over to the English section here. So it just changes the language to English. And then my favorite place on the website is over here by libraries. So without clicking, you just roll over libraries and you click on main library. So now we've gone over to the, to the university library website. The main library and then you go to quick links again I haven't clicked I'm just rolling over and I can already see underneath tools and guide I can already see uh, Scopus there and a librarian has just popped up and says that they are online and ready to help did you see that that's very good um, but if I click here on Scopus then I go straight in once I've filled in my username and password. Okay, so I'm in. You can all see that now. Um, it's important to register as well. Um, if you go in for the first time, you won't have your initials here. But if you do want to use it a lot, I, I recommend you register and have an account. It's free of charge from within this site. And um, once you're within the UAE University website, it's free to, to register. But then you can save searches in it and things. So if you want to do a document search, so remember there are about 70 million articles in here. So if you want to search for um, uh, something on, uh, let's say, um, nuclear fusion what it's going to do is search the titles of 70 million articles and the abstracts of those articles and the key words of those articles for to see which one of them contain these two words and just clicking their search will tell me that there are 64,000 uh, uh, papers. That's far too many for me to deal with. So what I would do is search again and you can go to edit. Which brings up the search again. This time I'm going to put it in, um, in speech marks, which means it's only going to search those two words together and both of them. So I hope to have a smaller number this time. Now only 7,162. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So what I do is I tend to build up my searches like this. Go to edit each time and start to, um, to work out some more things. So I've only searched article, title, abstract, and keywords, but I could search other things. Now I'm going to leave this here and open with this plus, you get a second go. And this time I'm going to look for, uh, you can look for specific authors, or you can look for specific journal titles, or you can look for affiliations. I'm gonna go for affiliation country, because I'm looking for a specific paper. And, um, I'll put here, I'm not sure how they uh, put United Kingdom. So now I've got down to 398 papers. And you can further filter in this left hand ribbon. You can filter by open access articles or other. Okay, you can filter by year. So if you want to know only articles from 2014, you click there. Uh, you can click by author name. Viewing more will give me the top uh, 10 authors 
by number of articles that they've published with these characteristics. You can look within the subject area, the specific subject area, which is another conversation entirely. Um, then we have document type. So we have articles. These are original articles. Uh, or you have papers presented at a conference. Then you've got review articles. By the way, review articles are the most highly cited articles of all. Then you've got books and other things down here. Source title is the, uh, the list of journal titles. Um, publication stage. So you can actually find that there's one article in press. That means it's been accepted by the journal, but it's not yet appeared uh, in print. Um, and then you have the affiliations. We've got different affiliations here. <clears throat> um, you can keep going, funding sponsor. So these are the people who provided the money for the work to be done. And you've got the, the countries. So I could also just come here and click to United Kingdom. Okay, so that's a simple search, which brings me down to, to a, a manageable number of articles. Imagine I want to say, what's been published in the last three years? I can go there, limit to. And I've got 75 documents. Okay, it's a bit of work, but just by looking at the abstracts, I would know from here whether I really want to uh, keep this article. I might look at that and say, yeah, no, not really, that's not what I wanted. Okay, hide the abstract again and move on. And you go down and say, oh, this one looks interesting. So I'm going to click here. And this one looks interesting, but in the end isn't. This one looks interesting and is. So you start clicking the ones that you want. Yeah, and then you can download them or export them in some way. Um, it's good to, uh, has somebody talked to you about um, bibliographic databases? If so, I would recommend Mendeley because it works very well with Scopus. Um, it's free as well. And um, you can then export those uh, documents into your Mendeley account. This, this is actually um, a separate discussion. We should have a whole session on working with library um, uh, databases. But this is um, basically where you find all that material that is used in the, uh, in the bibliometric analysis. And in fact, both QS rankings and Times Higher Education rankings use Scopus data to find out which universities publish more and are, have higher citation impacts. So that brings us back to the beginning of the, the presentation really, and that's why these databases are so important. So let's, let me stop again and go back and see if there are any more questions. Guys, if you have any questions, you can use the mic or write in the chat. Thank you for doing the feedback. Uh, for those who doesn't, please do it uh, since it's almost the end of the presentation or the workshop. It was really informative and helpful for all of us. So please go to the link and check the questions and fill the feedback, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks, Abdul Rahman, for organizing this and to everybody for participating. And um, yeah, so we're here to help you. Let us know your questions and, and what we can do. Thank you so much, Mr. Philip. That was really helpful. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.